Have you held a bottle of bourbon in your hand and wondered, how is this made? Sure, there is the grains and the barrels and all that science that goes into it. But what about the package design, glass manufacturing, shipping logistics, or purchase orders for thousands of cork stoppers? These are only a handful of things that you need to know. But with the University of Louisville's online distilled spirits business certificate, you're only a few clicks away from learning from industry experts from renowned spirits businesses like Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. Learn more about this online six-course certificate at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Kerry is fashionably late for his return. So said he's making a big entrance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, see, I like this new platform because I hold the power. Like, I actually don't have to put them on the screen. Perfect. Uh, really? This thing is actually, it's kind of cool how this works. Yeah. It is cool, yeah. All right, he's here now. Should I add him? Uh, can you can you like put his uh, his face like behind a curtain kind of thing or I can, alter his voice? I can uh, I can kick him from the studio. You may do that. Here, I'll put him in, <laughs> and then I'll take him out. Be like, oh! yeah. Hey everyone, it's episode two hundred and forty one of Bourbon Pursuit. And if it's your morning drive, good morning. If it's your daily run, break that record. And if you're sitting at work, let's make this day go by one hour faster. Last week, Whiskey Magazine presented their 2020 Icons of American Whiskey Awards in New York City. And I'll be damned if we weren't even considered in the running. Who knows, maybe next year. But here are some of the names that you might recognize. Brent Elliott from Four Roses was named Master Distiller of the Year. Buffalo Trace as the Best Distiller and Visitor Attraction. Peerless Distilling Company's Small Batch Kentucky Straight Bourbon was named the Best Kentucky Bourbon, while Rebel Yell took home the Best Kentucky Single Barrel Bourbon, and Iron Root Republic out of Texas as the Best Non-Kentucky, and E.H. Taylor Rye took home the Best Rye, while 291 Colorado Whiskey took home the Best New Make Award. And lastly, Peggy No Stevens accepted an induction into the Hall of Fame as well. Winners from the Icons of American Whiskey and World Whiskey Awards 2020 will now go head-to-head in their competition from across the globe to figure out who will be the best whiskey in the world and that will be presented in London in March of 2020. The Kentucky Distillers Association announced that the famed Kentucky Bourbon Trail and Kentucky Bourbon Trail Craft Tour destinations welcomed 1.7 million visitors in 2019 and now is celebrating its anniversary with its 21st birthday. Now, let's get into some bourbon economics. Beam Suntory saw solid sales growth in 2019, posting a revenue increase of 6.5% for the year, and Beam Suntory's flagship brand Jim Beam had a strong year in the U.S., where depletions increased 8.5% to 5.7 million cases, that also includes flavors variants of Jim Beam, according to Impact Data Bank's estimates. Now, Basil Hayden was another dynamic performer, estimated up 37% to 345,000 cases in the U.S. last year. And Japan became the largest export market for Jim Beam last year, driven by the highball craze. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir announced that Kentucky is leading the nation in whiskey exports, which shouldn't be much of a surprise. The governor made the announcement while filling the 16th million barrel of Jim Beam at Jim Beam's American Stillhouse in Claremont, Kentucky. And Kentucky led all states in whiskey exports in 2019 at $485 million. The total marks a 326% increase since 2004, while Canada, United Kingdom, France, Brazil, and Mexico make up the Commonwealth's top five export destinations. All right, today we've got The Roundtable, a show where internet friends gather and discuss a bunch of bourbon potpourri. And on this episode, we touch on three topics. We look at how brands and distilleries can start reaching new consumers and what are the best ways of getting your product in the eyes of them today. Then we take on the celebrity craze. Over the past year, there have been on half a dozen music artists and TV personalities that have come out with bourbons on the market. While we don't see this trend stopping anytime soon, we ask ourselves, is this good for bourbon as a whole? And lastly, we examine the current state of the secondary market. It's a group consensus that we all miss it, but what has been the effect for pricing, store pricing, and distributed allocation since this has all happened over six months ago? And if you're a Patreon supporter, you got the email yesterday that we're going to be doing a new pilot episode called 
Extra Pursuit. This is a new call-in radio show format that we're going to test out that is exclusively available to our Patreon community. We hope to see you online soon and make it successful to see how this thing's going to turn out. And speaking of things that are happening in the Patreon world, we have two barrel picks that are happening at Buffalo Trace this week. So if you want the opportunity to get your hands on one of these bottles of these private selections, as well as even possibly join us on the pick, go to patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. It's this community that funds a lot of the things that happen with this podcast, and we're happy that we can bring these experiences like this to so many of our listeners. It's showtime. So here's Joe from Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hey everyone, Joe here again. We enjoy finding and identifying barrels that contain distinctive traits and characteristics. We then bottle them at cast strength to retain their authentic qualities for the whiskey enthusiast. Next time, ask your bartender for barrel bourbon. I'm Fred Minnick and this is Above the Char. Right now, we're seeing a plethora of celebrity whiskeys come out. Most recently, Jason Aldean and Terry Bradshaw have announced their whiskeys, of course. Last year, we had Slipknot, Metallica, Bob Dylan. And I got to tell you, there's going to be a whole lot more coming. I'm even familiar with a few of them, that some of which I cannot disclose at this time. But let me just tell you, we should not think of celebrity whiskey as something that is the end of times or a sign that the bubble is about to bust. Rather, celebrity whiskeys just mean that we have right now the attention of all those who are interested in making money. And basically, celebrities are like any other business. They're all about trying to make money. And whiskey is one of the hottest games in town right now. Of course, it doesn't help that George Clooney actually made a couple billion dollars off of a tequila a few years ago. And so with the rise of spirits come more celebrities. I believe we should actually reward those who make good whiskey, or at least put their name on good whiskey. Here's the thing. This is what we don't want. We don't want whiskey to become the next vodka, where celebrities galore just kind of sign up and they just put their name on it. We want the celebrities to actually be involved. We want them to be involved with good whiskey. And, you know, the Matthew McConaughey project with Wild Turkey is a good example of how a celebrity can be used to improve a brand. Now... We'll see if that ends up working in the long haul, but I kind of like the idea of more celebrities coming into the game of whiskey. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Just search my name, Fred Minnick. Hey, until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. This is Bourbon Community Roundtable number 41. So we've been doing this quite a while, and we've got a whole lot of good topics lined up tonight. And it's usually the uh, the wrecking crew that we have here. We talk about some some culture things that are happening inside of bourbon, some of the you know latest news, and we kind of give our our best informed opinions. I know, I guess that's maybe what you call it. Uh, You know, maybe sometimes it's maybe sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong, but that's just part of the process. But yeah, most of the time I get them my comments. Uh, you know, decided right before the show. I just researched the topics and I'm like, okay, that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what the you topics are. The the show? Yeah. I yeah, I we go. This, yeah. Off the cuff. Well, that's, out. that's part of the fun. You know, we've done this enough by now. And I think that's also funny for Ryan and I, when we go and we're interviewing a lot of people nowadays, <laughs> they're all like, Hey, um, can you all send me like a list of questions that you want to answer ahead of time? We're like, no, <laughs> we don't have any. Can we're just in some questions to ask. <laughs> it's like, we're just going to show up and ask questions. This is how we do it now. <laughs> I don't think we had an agenda the first time, did we? For a round table? I don't remember. Yeah. It was the very mm, first one. No, that was so long was, ago. That's so long too long ago. ago. Yeah, my memory's gone. gone. I know. I know. But. You know, let's go ahead and I think we can uh, we can kick it off. So you heard some voices already. Uh, we'll save the, the the our new special guest tonight for last. You've heard his name on there before, but I'll start with uh, the guy who's always on here, Blake. You can't get rid of me. Got <laughs> ripping of the Bourbon Roundtable. Uh, I'm Blake from Bourboner. Um, yeah, always fun to be on. You know, still this is one of the one of the highlights of the month to jump on here, talk with you guys. So thanks for having me as always. Uh, you can find me on all the social medias. 
Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, B O U R B O N R, as well as my, I, I would say newer or new site, but it's kind of just newish at this point. Um, that's sealbox.com. So S E E L B A C H S. So thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Make sure you go check it out for all your craft whiskey needs, as well as Pursuit Series needs. You can go and get everything ordered right to your doorstep. That's right. <laughs> we always need it. So, Jordan, you're up next, buddy. Sure. This is Jordan from Breaking Bourbon, one of the three guys from BreakingBourbon.com. You can find us on all the socials at Breaking Bourbon and make sure to sign up for our newsletter. We're always sending out our latest calendar calendar releases. Is that starting already? Oh, it's it's been going already for, for a few weeks now. Oh gosh. Wow. You feel yeah. like it feels like it's it's a good time right now because you're like, oh, like we don't have to worry about anything crazy coming out. Like Stag Junior Batch 13, like oh, that came and went already. Now we can just relax for a minute, but it seems like you guys just want to keep the energy going. <laughs> It'd be nice if we got a break, that's for sure. But <laughs> the bourbon gods demand it. Yeah. <laughs> and we got Brian. How you doing, buddy? Hey guys, doing great. Thanks for having me again. This is Brian with Sip and Corn on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Sip and Corn. You can find me online at uh, either Sip and Corn or bourbonjustice.com. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. And we have a familiar face of the round table making his return. Kerry, how are you, buddy? Hey guys, hey. thanks for having me back on here. If uh if Blake is Cal Ripken of baseball, I'm uh, Fernando Rodney. I'm the reliever that you call in once in a while and you're really nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen when I come out. So <laughs> yeah, he could he could, he could I thought you were more like John Rocker. Yeah. yeah, it could either be yeah, strong yeah. or not, but at least I'll look good with my hat turned a little bit to the side. <laughs> it's all that matters. Just come sprinting out. Yeah, sprinting out of right field. That's right. People Shoot still my watch baseball. Yeah, well, I don't thanks for having baseball. me back, guys. This is, this is awesome. Well, Ryan asked if people still watch baseball. I, I certainly have paid zero attention to it, but I don't know about you all. Then again, Louisville's not much of the uh, amazing. We got the Louisville Slugger Museum. We got the basically the biggest names with baseball here with the equipment, yet like the city just really doesn't care that much about baseball because we don't have a pro team. You just got to go an hour and a half north to be able to do that. Yeah, and they stink. Yeah, yeah. there's no point to like go up there. <laughs> baseball's hot right now just because of the controversy. Like Everybody's talking about no. it now. So, so yeah. is this the, the Astros controversy? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which yeah. is crazy if you look in depth at all of the stuff that's come out and then consider like the latest evidence where the guy was holding his jersey when he was crossing home. Play. I mean, the whole thing's <laughs> like definitely a made for TV <laughs> movie coming out. Oh, it's ridiculous. Uh, Lifetime awesome. movie coming, coming yeah. to you. But it keeps it fun, keeps it interesting. It maybe, I think maybe like every once in a while, like sports have to do these things. So like they got to create something to, to hype it back up again. Cause as it, as it starts hitting this little plummet, you're like, oh, and we're back up again. Yeah. They said this is actually good for baseball, but bad for the Astros. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true. Uh, somebody's got to be a pawn in the game at the end of the that's day. Right. So, all right. So let's go ahead and start hitting some topics tonight. So the first one we want to do is we want to start looking at marketing and trying to figure out. Really, how are bourbon distilleries and producers, how do they reach new bourbon drinkers? And I know that we've, we've thrown our, a few different ideas around here. And I know, Jordan, you had uh, had some thoughts coming into this. So how do you kind of feel that distillers or bourbon distilleries and marketing, like how should they be reaching new consumers nowadays? Yeah, so I think there's two parts, right? And I'll make this short, but two parts. One is through people of the industry and making sure their products get out in their hands and making sure that we're highlighting them. Right. So for example, heaven Hill just sent out the whole new, latest batch of Elijah Craig, right. Which was great. And, and everyone's posting bottles of it and doing reviews. And honestly, that's okay because usually it's a slam dunk bourbon, right. For the most part, but other distilleries don't do that. Right. Buffalo trace released that press release for stag batch 13. They didn't send out any bottles. They just did a press release. So you know, I think the distilleries that are getting smart are making sure that bottles get in hands of different review sites or different people on social media and making sure it gets out there. And then from just a standard consumer standpoint, right, I think it's the people that are doing a lot of just um, non-distiller producers, right? It's who is a fun label, who is a backstory, good, right, wrong, and indifferent, whatever your opinion may be on it. That's the people who walk in. I have so many friends who go into a liquor store, they'll text me, hey, this looks really cool. The label's cool, fun backstory, you know anything about it. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's Dickel. So is every other thing in your hand on the shelf, right? And they don't know hey, what that hey, means, hey. though. They're just looking for a fun bottle to give don't us a present. Be, or Don't be a dick. <laughs> so, but there's nothing there's nothing wrong with Dickel either. It's just you have to know kind of who's picking and who's selecting, right? I mean, we all know we've had some fantastic Dickel barrels coming out of there. But it's just 
you know, that was just an example. So it's, it's the people who are doing it right are making sure they're getting out to the influential folks and talking about it. And then the rest are trying to just win over the consumer with fun packaging. And that's kind of been tried and true throughout the years. And so do you think they're doing a better job now than, um, I mean, Fred's not here. We can poke a jab at him than, than <laughs> saying like uh, buying another magazine ad or something like that. I think, I think they got smarter with the dollars and how they do stuff, right? And, and I'll go back to Heaven Hill, for example. Right. They could just as well put up a billboard in Louisville or, or anywhere else, or they could have put out a, a huge new spread in, in Bourbon Plus or, or another magazine, right? Whiskey Advocate announcing Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. Instead, what they do, they got smart. Instead of sending a sample that people are reviewing it, they sent a bottle. And you know what? It's popping up all over social media, all over websites, and that cost them a fraction of what it would cost to a major advertising campaign. They, they smartened up. Um, they truly have. Uh, I didn't get a bottle. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I you start get, blogging you again, get back in the game. <laughs> I mean, Carrie had it after Bourbon and Beyond. He had like a nice couple week run of uh, you know really being on it. And he's like, yeah, no, nah, this that'll fuck. Like, and he wasn't even saying right? he was back, right? I mean, it yeah, was a whole thing. Was Look, guys, Bourbon blogging is two hobbies. It's the love of bourbon as a hobby, and the love of writing as a hobby. And I've come to realize I only like one of those two hobbies a lot. <laughs> I like it's talking funny. bourbon and I like <laughs> hanging out with people about bourbon, but it's just the, the writing thing. It just, it inspires me for a while and then it, it goes away. But I'm telling if I finished the unfinished stuff that I have in my blog, I mean, I'd have like, <laughs> I'd have like two and a half posts. It'd be amazing. So someday we'll get back to it. But my question about the marketing stuff, are you referencing celebrities marketing that or just how they're trying to reach consumers through their no, marketing? I think, I think, I think we'll get much we'll like get. us. Yeah, I mean, we'll get to that in a little bit. I, you know, I'm kind of looking at, you know, how do we reach new bourbon drinkers, right? And I think we'll get into the celebrities thing in a little bit because that's kind of like the, a second segment of the show. But, you know, there's another thing that that I think brought up in our, our kind of private chat. And that was, uh, you know, and I, I kind of want to stay on this topic a little bit before I start switching gears a little bit, you know, as we start looking into the uh, quote unquote influencer realm, right? It's kind of a it's kind of like i don't know do you guys like the word i feel like i, I feel like nasty when I, I call myself an influencer like that. yeah no 100 just like <laughs> yeah, that don't like it yeah not good yeah well but, but the sad part is it's true right you guys are influencers though i mean you uh, are I like when that. yes the, the uh under the the junior or, batch 12 <laughs> that you can't find anymore and, and the price went up do you know why that one went up it's because of that guy right there jordan yep. that's why that was yeah, that was definitely a breaking. <laughs> so we will breaking we'll certainly take credit for that. But you know, in our book, and and I agree with what um, Kenny just said. And you know, I we don't like the word influencer. I think to us, right, we put a ton of work into breaking bourbon. It's more than just a hobby, right? It's it's almost a full time job at this point. It's a job upon a job, and and we work our butts off for that. And when I think of influencer, I think of somebody out on a beach with a bottle, and they're taking a picture. And that's it. That's all they're going to put into yeah. it, right? They're looking at their latest filter on Instagram, and that's how they're influencing folks. For us, it's truly a love and a passion of making sure we get out um, our thoughts to consumers that when they're new consumers or old consumers going to the liquor store, we're able to help them pick out the right bourbon that's right for them, right? And that's more than just influencing. That. That's that's right. going out and doing a job, just showing your love for the hobby. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I think it. Uh, you know, kind of what Jordan said with. Uh, how far is the influencer taking it? Like, all right, you know, uh, are, are they writing posts? And I had this conversation with, um, with, with Josh from whiskey jug about, you know, you can have an influencer who do an Instagram story that's there for 24 hours. What does that really get you? You know, is there really an ROI on that? But if they put an Instagram story, if they do a post, if they do a blog post, then you have SEO, you have backlinks, you have all this other stuff that's kind of building around it. Um, so, you know, I think you almost have to be hitting all those areas to have some kind of influence. Um, but as far as which brands are doing the best, I mean, you think about, uh, I, I know somebody mentioned this in the chat. I think Beam does a really good job of this. Uh, Barrel always does a good job about getting bottles out to people who are going to, you know, have an audience and can post them. Um, Heaven Hills come on strong. I mean, I don't, did anybody receive anything from Heaven Hill until about two years ago? Um, I know I didn't. Um, so those are a few that I think definitely pop up. Um, and Buffalo Trace seems to be taking the opposite approach of, you know, we don't need as, as much of this. So, you know, it used to, if there was something you could get a sample, um, it'd be two ounces or something like that. And now even that seems pretty limited. Um, well, do you but what they're doing, they get so it, many it, damn it, pictures. It, it, 
of, of just normal people. Yeah. Put the yeah. Bottle. So why would they? Why would the, they uh, yeah. Why would they send to to really anyone when just some Joe buying it has to take a croc shot, crop shot just because he found Eagle Rare or something like that? Well, yeah. And, and somebody yeah. was crotch. flipping the sample bottles too. So. <laughs> no, that yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, there's that. Yeah. I don't know that that sample size really makes a difference in terms of marketing, because the people that are using you guys your opinions probably are already into the hobby right so you've got the the new people that they're trying to market to and then you've got the people who are in the bourbon world who might not look at their brand who they're trying to get them to switch so i th- i don't know i feel like some of it too is um the marketing by using and i guess we're getting into that part but the marketing kind of gets into trying to influence young people right because you have people who in my mind people in college it's first try bourbon if they haven't already you know but when you're 21 and you're in college and you try it and and then you know you're having evan williams at a football game or something and then you graduate and you wanted a nicer bourbon to move to i feel like that's kind of i really don't know if that's where they're targeting but it would seem like that would be your market maybe i'm, I'm going to disagree just a little bit and at least i'll speak for us and not a humble brag but you know we have millions of unique people come to breaking bourbon every year and I guarantee you that the that the in-depth crowd that we get caught up in on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, nowhere near is that high, right? So that means to us, there's a lot of folks who aren't invested in the bourbon world who go to Breaking Bourbon. And I guarantee you, it's probably the same thing for Bourbon Pursuit. They're probably picking up a ton of new people who aren't deep in the bourbon sphere, right? And same with Brian and his book. I bet you have a lot of people who are just really into law or just into Kentucky history picking it up that yeah. aren't... that. that I have no relation whatsoever and who don't know what bourbon pursuit is, what breaking bourbon is. So the audience we reach is actually much greater than, than we actually realize. And, and it's not everyone who's viewing this, you know, round table right now. It's, it's much greater than that. So but do you think they have discovered that because they realize they love bourbon or they're mm-hmm. just trying bourbon and saying, Oh, you know, I like bourbon. I'm going to find bourbon and people I, on the internet. I don't know. We ask, we ask a lot of folks who write into us for the first time for the emails. We say, Hey, how'd you hear breaking bourbon? Said honestly, I was in a liquor store trying to find more information before I dropped forty bucks on a bottle. Never heard of you guys before, but you know it's good. So to they know probably you searched the brand. They searched the brand. Or the bottle. Nope, they totally don't know about breaking yeah. bourbon. They're just searching for bourbon. They're trying to get into it. They're trying to make sure that their dollar is right. To us, we get so caught up. Us, oh, just two hundred dollar bottle, three hundred dollar bottle, uh, right? The average consumer, we you know you need to remember thirty or forty bucks. It's a lot of money to drop on a bottle sure. of bourbon, right? So that, that's what they're looking for. Make sure they're spending their dollars wisely. Yeah, and look, Jordan, your, sense. Yeah. Your, your, your point's really good, Jordan. The people that I talk to in a lot of the presentations that I've been doing now, they don't know. It. They're they're not the bourbon enthusiasts. They don't yep. really don't know anything. And I'm having to explain to them when we're doing a bottled and bond tasting what in the world bottled and bond is. And they've never had the three that we've got on the on the tasting. So I think you're right there. There's a lot of new people coming into it. And that's that's really what the brands are after, I think. I I compare it to like, uh, you know, picking up other hobbies. So if, if I'm looking at wine accounts, I I may be falling for a complete marketing gimmick, but because I saw something on Instagram, so I want to try a bottle of wine or like, you know, some golf tool that is not going to help my game at all, but that's, I, I don't know the difference. So I try to find the accounts that I think I can trust and that are giving good feedback and, um, you, you know, just going from there and, uh, like kind of both of y'all alluded to, I think we really just, you know, don't give enough attention to the fact that the majority of the bourbon market is not guys like us. <laughs> it's, it's not guys that know what, what mash bills are made <laughs> where, or, or even care about it. You know, it's like, Hey, I got $40 to spend. I don't want to feel dumb because I get this bottle home and it tastes terrible. Where do I go? Um, and, you know, I think that's that's probably 80 percent of the market at this point. Yeah. For so sure. another kind I, of thing that, that I, makes me happy that this is all happening as well is that, you know, shout out to Heaven Hill and a few other ones that, that send you full bottles. Right. I mean, that gets you uh, a much better Instagram shot than like a little two ounce sample, a little cup that, you know, kind of comes in and stuff like that. So uh, I'm we're always happy to get the full bottles. I think that's fantastic. You used My to get family members love the full bottles because they know I'm just going to like review it, take a few pictures, and then they get the bottle. So they think it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Kenny used to get shafted, and now he's he's on the he's he's all the way up. Now, now. we get too many. Yeah, <laughs> too many. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's nothing wrong there, Ryan. Absolutely no, no. not. Absolutely yeah. not. But and so, 
Oh, Go ahead, sorry. Ryan. Do I get to give a point or no? We pass. Some- <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I can put you on mute now. No, yeah. no. Go ahead. Is that my first strike? Uh, no, I I totally agree with what Blake says. Uh, and I've talked to you about this, Kenny, before. Like we to get bourbon and expand it, we got to go to fringe audiences, like people that are interested in food or cigars or wine or like even cooking with green eggs or you know smoking yeah. food. You know, there's just that's where they got to start allocating their money to because people that are nerdy about something they're going to be nerdy about bourbon they're going to dive in to whatever they're interested in and that's who you want are those people that are passionate about their hobbies and so if you can get to those fringe audiences that kind of tie into what you got going on so the other part of this about looking at uh you know how are they reaching new customers is we look at label designs and sort of what's happened in the market and one of the most recent things that we can think of of course is like the new baker's redesign right um taking something that was a a flagship product redesigning it giving it a, a basically a face a facelift of a label um it's a new bottle new tops and everything like that do you all anticipate seeing this as a, another trend forward where we could expect more brands to start saying like, oh, okay, let's let's keep the brand, but let's give it a whole new facelift. Let's break it, see a little more younger, a little more energetic, anything like that. Isn't that kind of part of marketing 101 anyway, is is rebranding your image if if uh, sales are hurting a little bit? I feel like that's kind of kind of a standard, especially in the bourbon world where it's just a label. You just change a label up and it, you know, people, it sells yeah. out and people are like, Hey, I got pre-label stuff for sale and people go crazy. And you know, the, the fear of FOMO sets in. <laughs> or but you I change the, you change the proof or double the price too. You know, that. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> I, I think that's a lot of it too, right? I think it's a good excuse and I'm not justifying this at all, but I think brands are looking for a way to increase price, right? What an easy thing to do. Let's relabel it. Let's not relabel it, but let's rebrand it, right? New bottle, different label, make it a little more upscale. Right. Just slide on high-end. 5, 10, 15, 20 dollar more cost to the price. Right. And I think you, you've been seeing that with a lot of brands doing it. Or let's switch from screw top to cork. Let's do little things that make it feel more high end, same bourbon. Right. But now they're going to start charging more. And somehow people feel it's okay because they're not seeing the same bottle with a new increased price. They're seeing a new bottle with an increased price. Yeah. And there's some people in chat that are talking about how wild turkey is going through yet another one. I think we've, we've touched on this before. Like, haven't they done like, two or three of them in the past like five or six years of like just subtly changing things on the wild turkey 101 label well now it looks like they may switch the bottle up completely based on the last one i saw is that i mean i don't know if that's confirmed yet but they, yeah they change every they, they're probably too much i mean look at what rare breed has rare done breed, over the last yeah. six years and i mean they it's it seems pointless a lot of them are are small changes and then You've got the ones that do the big changes. I think that's where people notice. Uh, a lot of people aren't going to notice that rare b- breed has changed four times in the last six years. Yeah, I, I think there's. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this one, but you, 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 we've seen a lot over the last few years. You know, Weller had a overhaul. Seventeen ninety two had an overhaul. Elijah Craig had an overhaul, um, <coughs> and now you know Baker's being the most recent. And I would say probably Baker's was the most successful with it because I can't like, I've loved Baker's for a long time and I don't know why more people didn't drink it. And all of a sudden, like it comes out in a cool bottle and people are like, Oh man, have you tried Baker's? Like, this is not a new product. <laughs> like, was, was it always single barrel though? No, was it, no, it was not barrel? always single barrel. So okay. that did change, but, um, but it's, I mean, I mean go back and taste it against some older Baker's and you'll be like, wow, this is, really good um i love the new stuff but uh, i mean i that's a huge win i think for beam because people now love it it looks so much better on the shelf there's more people buying it people realize how good it is um and all they did was change the label you know and call it single barrel um so that's marketing 101 right the wine world talk yeah everybody had to do labels and we got new bottles and they sell yeah You, you know how many screw how many screw caps do we have on the market today as opposed to just, you know, five years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not a whole lot. You, you know, it, uh, it, there's something about that that value of pulling off a cork instead of unscrewing. You know, even Weller Antique, even after the redesign, went to a, a, a cork instead of the screw cap. So Very old Barton. That's yeah. all I can think of. Yeah. 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 Um, and now what's the next one? Uh, Benchmark? Benchmark's about to get a uh, yeah. overhaul? Oh, that's doing a whole new line of Benchmark bourbon, too. So yeah. there's a whole new yeah. line extension. 
I mean, I mean we, Buffalo we, Trace just moves down the line, right? I mean, I mean sure. We, we've talked about that on a roundtable. It had been over a year ago. I think that we talked about how they kind of go in the cycle of like finding something and re reinvigorating or reinventing it. You know, like 1792 was a very good example of that in the past year and a half of maybe even two and a half years now uh, of what they've done to actually bring out new line extensions, repackaging, everything like that to uh, really uplift the brand from what it had actually been before. So as we kind of continue down this path too and trying to figure out, well, what a, how people are they going to be reaching new consumers? And we look at something that we had talked about before, and that's celebrities. Celebrities getting into whiskey, uh, notably bourbon. You know, there's, there's a lot of things in whiskey, but, you know, this is bourbon pursuit. I think we'll focus on bourbon. And so in the past year, you know, we've had Bob Dylan. There's been Slipknot, Metallica, Matthew McConaughey. And now uh, Florida Georgia Line and Jason Aldean are now teaming up to create their own. Uh, and then also in the past two weeks, I think one that maybe took us all by shock was Terry Bradshaw. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I saw that too. And I was like, well, I mean like Captain Kirk, like I understood that one. Like, but like Terry Bradshaw, like really, that's a new one. Uh, did you watch him during the Super Bowl? Steelers Pretty fans, sure he was man. drinking it live during that, uh, during that broadcast. Yeah, well, talk about the best <laughs> advertisement you could. <laughs> There's freaking terrible towels everywhere. You you look at like watch every Steelers game, no matter where they are. It's like there's they're just everywhere. It's they like, hand them out when you buy McDonald's here, Ryan. <laughs> yep, exactly. I think um, you know a lot of it's going to be back to right George Clooney's Trace Amigos, right? So if you're another celebrity and you have any influence whatsoever and you have a name recognition, if you realize three guys can pull off a billion dollar brand, you're going to try and get in it. Right. And I think what people fail to realize, or maybe not people, right. I think people realize what celebrities fail to realize is that isn't always the case. Like lightning, that was a lightning in a bottle type situation. Like Dan Aykroyd's had crystal skull vodka since 2007. Right. And like people know what that is, but by no means is that a billion dollar brand. Right. So I think everyone trying to cash in on their fame and, and do it. I, I think they're probably not going to see a, a huge payout. Right. They may get a kick out of seeing their name on a bottle of whiskey or on a bottle of alcohol but if they're looking for a payout like the other folks had good luck i think ryan reynolds is the next track to really take a very gin super far right i think he's beyond yeah. the i think that's a smart move too with the gin route instead yeah. of you yeah, know for sure you're, you're targeting a cool market instead which I, I don't know maybe we're just all wrong and we're still like over uh or underestimating the amount that people care about like what's actually in the bottle um but no, I mean, I, I, I was texting with OJ Lima uh, about this and he said, nobody wants to buy, sh buy shoes from a guy or basketball shoes from a guy who can't dunk, but it's kind of a little different in the bourbon world. You know, it's, it's like, you know, what is actually dunking in the bourbon world? So if Slipknot comes out with a bourbon or a whiskey, whatever they came out with, like people buy it, I guess. I don't know. Well, um, did they buy it though? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah it was great. Like, let, let them buy it. Here, like crazy. There, there, there's like, more for me of, of what I want. If, <laughs> if they're going to leave my four rows of single barrel alone and I can actually find it on the shelf again, great. You know, sell it out. They'll come back and buy more. I would think so. Yeah. I, I'm a little more indifferent on this one because it's like if that's what, what people want to do and that brings more people into the industry and to buy, you know, hopefully they come in because they want to buy um, – whoever terry bradshaw bourbon and then they're like oh hold on there's actually people who make this who make a lot of other good products that's just one more consumer in the door so um I mean, you're speaking as the guy you know with seal box sure as the guy who already walks into total wine <laughs> and there's people around the corner and all, you know you just want to check out and they all want blanton's and you're like fuck all of it. sorry you know just you guys are driving me crazy here and they, they, you know, everything is impossible to get nowadays. From that standpoint, you, you know, you don't want more people in the hobby. But I get where you're coming from too, because it's from our standpoint of people who love hobby and love to talk about, you know, love bourbon and talk about bourbon. It's good for us, for them to bring more people in. Yeah, I think there's one thing that I really wish that we were able to see in this world is like if these celebrities really love whiskey and love bourbon as much as they do. Like I wish there was. Like if if they were promoting it themselves, like if they were if they were drinking a bottle of Buffalo Trace or Wild Turkey or whatever it is, and we got you know we saw that more often, then we're like, oh my, like these guys are really into bourbon, right? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Versus somebody that like, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a picture service to like somebody drinking a Four Roses, and they're like, hey, now I'm gonna start a brand, right? Like I just I just wish there was just something more. Uh, like that was deep into it. They're like, it was able to tell a story that would get people like us excited. 
right? Yeah. I don't I don't think yeah. it really gets people like us excited because I mean, it feels it feels bad. Like I feel like we're we're dissing on them a little bit. But the 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 thing is is like they're not really trying to reach us per se, right? Yeah. And and I wish that there was a little bit more something that appeals to the whiskey geek in this category that says like, oh, like this is why we want to do it because we had so much enjoyment of doing this and this and this, which uh, you know, you take this and you look at what Fred has done by interviewing the guys at Slipknot. Um, same thing with uh, Metallica uh, and actually like getting the story of, you know, they're like basically them and why they started the brand and really like what whiskey means to them. Like, I just don't want this to snowball to the point where every celebrity is starting to come out with some type of liquor. I mean, everybody's talking here in the chat. Like I know the rock is getting ready to come out with a type of tequila. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's going to continually uh, growing, you know, it's going to grow more and more. However, I just want to make sure that, you know, I, and it sounds bad. I feel like I'm on the bachelor bachelorette. Be like, I hope they're in it for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Which I did have to sacrifice and DVR the bachelor tonight. So y'all are welcome. Oh man. <laughs> oh no. It, but I mean, like overall, like in, and I'll, I'll you know, Brian, I'll kind of go to you first. Like, do you see this as like good or bad for the whiskey world? With a career as a master distiller spanning almost 50 years, as well as a Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Famer and having over 100 million people taste his products, Steve Nally is a legend of bourbon who for years made Maker's Mark with expertise and precision. His latest project is with Bardstown Bourbon Company, a state-of-the-art distillery in the heart of the bourbon capital of the world. They're known for their popular Fusion series. However, they're adding something new in 2020 with a release named The Prisoner. It starts as a nine-year-old Tennessee bourbon that is then finished in the Prisoner Wine Company's French oak barrels for 18 months. The good news is, is you don't have to wait till next year to try it. Steve and the team at Bardstown Bourbon Company have teamed up with Rackhouse Whiskey Club. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Their December box features a full-size bottle of Bardstown's Fusion Series and a 200 milliliter bottle of The Prisoner. There's also some cool merch inside, and as always, with this membership, shipping is free. Get your hands on some early release Bardstown bourbon by signing up at RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. Do you see this as like good or bad for the whiskey world? I, I think it's indifferent. I mean, the, the people who know what they're doing and the people who who look at look at you guys for reviews they're they're going to be picking the ones that are are worth buying and i can't imagine that a lot of these are are worth buying so i don't see it as affecting me too terribly much anybody else you guys are awful quiet on this one (laughs) yeah i mean i i feel like i i don't know i gave my opinion of I, i don't think it's bad to bring more people into the whiskey world like are we pushing it to jump the shark even further? I don't think so because there's going to be so much whiskey and, you know, Drake released his own whiskey a few years ago. And, you know, it's just something that constantly happens. If there's money to be made, you're going to have these people who say, Hey, let's, let's throw a big name on a brand. You be the face of it. And, we'll handle the back end. So I, I don't think of it as a bad thing. You know, if, if that means that there's more, bottles on the shelf when people walk into a total wine and maybe they see a, a name they recognize so they buy it good for them but um i don't i don't know i don't i don't think see it as something that like kind of interferes with our lane of the, yeah. the bourbon nerd world uh, i just want to know if any of it is going to be good is what i'm more well, i mean in. Well, you know how many how many bottles of actual bad bourbon have you had from major distilleries and i'm talking about like stuff you can't drink are it, major it, distilleries doing rock and roll band releases though? I mean, I think they're sourcing from there's, somewhere. So I don't think definitely you know, contracts out there. Was, <laughs> yeah. a, Do we yeah, know for sure? Yeah. Any? Well, any I can Buffalo tell you, Trace? I mean, no, I don't think it's any, any Buffalo Heaven Trace. Hill? But, no, but I can tell I you, mean, right. maybe some Heaven Hill, maybe some MGP, maybe, you know, Bartons so. and. The yep, usual suspects. Yep, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and you know, the Terry Bradshaw bourbon, it's all from OZ Tyler, right? <laughs> and I believe it's gosh, it might be a three or just a four year old or something like yeah. that. So that might be one of the first brands that are gonna be coming out of uh OZ Tyler. 
and and Brian, I know you see you they're making some faces, but you know, you gotta you gotta you gotta understand about like Ozzy Tyler. Like sometimes it gets a bad rap because the only like people pin Ozzy Tyler with par- Terrapure. Like that's right. what that's yeah. what people. That's pin where my head went. Yeah, exactly. That was a big mistake on their part because they they're that Jega McCall is actually a really good master distiller there, and he makes an outstanding product. But they have that black eye on them because of this like Terrapure thing because it's like, I mean, it's a. Everybody thinks it's a gimmick and nobody's going to get a fair, fair shot. So they're, just I think gimmick. they're actually trying to rebrand and come out with new brands that, you know, aren't OZ Tyler so they can get away from that. But back to the celebrity thing, I think it's good. The more you get it to the, if you, well, it's good if you want bourbon to grow. If you don't want it to grow, then it's bad. The more you can get into common people, it's just the natural progression of any product. The more appealing it is to the mass audience, celebrities do that, whether you like it or not. Yep. I mean, that's just that's just and, the and way if that the gets works. them interested in a little bit of bourbon history and bourbon law, then so be it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I've got a, I know a book they can read. I know a great <laughs> book that they can check out if they get into it. No, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. I think the more people drinking bourbon, right, whether that's good or bad for people trying to find bottles, it is what it is. But the more people are drinking it, the more money that producers are willing to invest in it, right, big or small. And more so, the more legs that bourbon has to go a long time before there is a, a, you know, it's a boom and bust cycle. So before there's a bust, and honestly, if they can keep this up, then it's just ingrained in the American culture, right? And then you'll see bourbon out there. Let's be real. You don't want to see a bust like flavored vodka, what, 15 years ago when everyone was drinking flavored vodka 20 years ago. Let me tell you, how many of you are walking through the store like, I think I'll pick up some bubblegum vodka to drink tonight. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, right? If you drink bourbon now and, and other people see you drinking it for 10, 15 years, if it holds on long enough, that's cultural. That's generational, right? And then we actually have bourbon taking off and just becoming more mainstream, um, which is fantastic. I mean, I mean, this is this is a good discussion because I think, you know, as we it, it, there's a lot of things that are happening in the comments as well. People are saying, you know, like basically there's uh, who was it that was uh, Hank Williams Jr. Or Booker was in a Hank Williams Jr. music video. Um, would Dramhound say that there's, I forget, I'm, I saw something else, but basically saying uh, whoever was, was, was pushing Dickel a lot back in the day as well. And so I think celebrities do have a role in this, right? As, as an advertising mechanism and stuff like that, getting into it. I mean, and Mila Kunis has been doing it for a while and that's, but that's just the advertising side of it. I mean, we're talking about actually like having a hand at creating something that is a product, which is completely different in my opinion right uh where i think they probably have a lot more skin in the game they've got their dollars invested into it and so it becomes something that is uh, a cornerstone for them that they've got to make they've got to make successful and so if if they don't then it could end up being like trump vodka right who knows right uh where it just is no longer on the shelves or something like that but love trump yeah. vodka <laughs> if you're sitting on it i think it's worth something nowadays and and speaking of worth something now i guess that kind of leads into a uh, it's 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 always a topic we love and we hate it the second at the at, at the time but that is the secondary market nice transition i know yeah. <laughs> i try to find ways to make it fun and interesting without like pinning myself as like oh the people that always talk about the secondary market but it, it truly is like one of those things that we're now Gosh, five months, almost six months since the uh, since the kind of wow, smackdown, if you will. Long. Yeah, does, it really. Has. Does it still exist? Wow. No, I'm kidding. Well, that's kind of what we're gonna go into a little I bit. But like, July, July was when the group I was running went down. So it's been it over been, six months. Yeah. So yeah. there we go. I was I was thinking it was like sometime like September time frame or something like yeah. that. But if it was before then, then then we are definitely over six months. So I guess we're going to kind of talk about the the current state of the secondary. Um, me personally, i i made a I made a prediction on our the last of 2019 episode saying that 2020 was going to be the kind of rebirth of it, where a new Facebook group is going to come up. This whole thing was just going to fly over, like blah 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 blah. Who cares? Uh, so far, I've been completely wrong. Uh, that has not come to fruition. It is continuing to. Uh, groups either be shut down or there's just new rules and saying like no posting of dollar signs or anything like that. But there has not been a, a group that has started to break, uh, you know, really come up and, and make a name for itself. Uh, at the same exact time, bottle spot has suffered a casualty, uh, which was something that I did not see coming, um, which 
I don't know. That, that kind of took me by surprise. I don't know about you all, but right so now I would say I would say, I would say the current state of the market is um, if we're going to go like red, yellow, green, like it's going to be in the pink area, right? It's mm -hmm. it's it's in a it's in a no bueno state still. Yep, it's certainly maybe not life support, but close to life support, right? It's nothing's really popped up. I think two things. One, Facebook got really good about shutting down groups, right? You saw a bunch pop up right after the second area, the bugs shut down, and they just kept smacking down other ones. I think a little bit of Facebook doing better about patrolling things. I think it was a little bit more of people out there saying, well, now's my chance to report everything, right? A little bit of little bit of Facebook heroes going on, we'll call it. But um, I think it's a loss. I think it's a loss to community, whether or not, I mean, I never bought or sold on the secondary, but what I loved doing was just seeing the latest trends, what people were really after, right? I loved seeing new consumers. I didn't love seeing new consumers hoard a case or two of different bourbon they just decided to get into the week before, but it really showed what people were after and what brands were becoming hot, what brands were cooling down, um, what was coming and what people were really looking forward to. And, th and that's just gone from just a pure, you know, gamesmanship, just a fly on the sidelines watching that's gone. And that's a shame. Um, you know, and I think it's also a shame too, for everyone who now bought cases and cases of bourbon, that they just started to get into thinking they flip it easy. Sure. Hope they like drinking it or sure. Hope you on a lot of parties. I'm torn up. <laughs> <laughs> you still got all those diamonds. Don't you? Yeah. I'm down Brian. with two diamonds. <laughs> I, I don't think the market's really that much. <clears throat> it's still there. It's just more spread out. There's more places, there's more rules. I mean, when one market goes down, another one comes back up. It uh, it still exists, and and you can't stop it. I mean, it, no. it's going to exist is the thing, and and yeah. it'll it, whether it's Facebook or someone finds another platform or whatever, it it'll exist. I mean, I, I wish it to Jordan's point. I wish you could kind of see it from the sidelines, but it's still going to exist. It, yeah. And so I think it actually has been affected way more. You know, I'm kind of with Kenny where it. it stopped and slowed down way more than I thought it would. You know, I, I thought it would always exist and it, it does to an extent, but it definitely took a big hit. You know, I think just the fact that all these massive groups were shut down. I, I don't know if there's a group that is in the, you know, is there a group in the six, well, not in the six figures in the five figures or, or even 10,000 plus members that hasn't been shut down. Um, probably not. So, um, you know, it definitely takes a big hit. And now it's like you have all these, you know, people just selling Weller 12 or bottles that really shouldn't be sold. Yeah. Nobody's doing that as much anymore because it's not open. It's not as big of a market. So um, all in all, I think it was a pretty surprising change and how it all went down. So um, I still think it's a, a detriment to the bourbon world because whether you love it or hate it, that was a big part of just watching, you know, what was getting sold, what were the trends, you know, older bottles. And yeah, it was just kind of fun to see that stuff be sold. You know, I'm kind of with Jordan, like I didn't participate, but I liked seeing that what was going on. So yeah. me, it's a little disappointing. I definitely, I, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, we need no, more Ryan. Come on. I know we do need more Ryan. I'm torn about the secondary market. I'm kind of relieved about it because like <laughs> I'm not doing like mega balls and all this crazy like <laughs> gambling and stuff like and trying to like, but it's also because it is a bummer. Like you used to, you know, that was my night, like scrolling through, seeing what people are buying, what they're selling, yeah. what they're going for. Um, I do love the yard sale stuff. Oh my God. It cracks me up. That, yeah, keeps, me, <laughs> that, that keeps me entertained. But uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, I'm indifferent about if it's detrimental to bourbon. I mean, it's detrimental to us, but is it, I think bourbon's just like we were talking about earlier, we forget about the common consumer and they have no idea this exists still and it doesn't affect them. It's still growing um, besides that. But I do think some brands like really valued from the secondary market, Buffalo Trace being one of them, I'm not really sure that they would be what they were without it. And I don't, and there's brands like Old Scout there's no way they would be anything without the secondary market. Blom brothers, all these MGP brands, nobody would have gave a, you know, two flips about them if uh, there wasn't a secondary market out there. And so I think it, it, it does hurt us, but I think people got in it early enough to where they got educated about brands that mm -hmm. they didn't know existed. And now um, it does suck for the people that bought bottles, but I don't know. Do you think like, so 
I'm going to give a shout out to my boy Guthrie at Toddy's. I know he's listening in, but do you think like liquor stores that can sell that stuff now, does that help them, you know, with pricing or does it hurt pricing? Well, I think it, in my opinion, this is, this has become a, a basically a guessing game, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, Oh, I got this bottle. What's it worth? I mean, Blake, we had this conversation in the yeah. group the other day. He came across some, some pre pros and he was like, Hey, what is this worth? I can't. we're like, shit. I don't know. We don't have a database. There's no, there's no information. And so it's like, there's no way that we can really like pin a price down on any of this stuff anymore. You know, and, and thankfully the, uh, is the, even the, I mean, I, I think the bottle blue book's still there because it's ran by uh, some of our uh, really, really good friends of the show as well. Uh, but that might be the only indication of a value of anything that's even out there in the market anymore. And even at that is still like, it's a varied range, right? Like a, a mm -hmm. E.H. Taylor tornadoes anywhere from like 1300 to 2000. Like that's, that's <laughs> all over the place in my opinion. Yeah. yeah but if you look at, it's still what's, what blows my mind is that if you look at Pappy 15, despite everything that has happened to all the markets, it's established value is still the exact same as it was before all of the markets crashed. It hasn't changed. It's still the exact same. It, I and I think that'll be the culture going that, forward too, though. That's the one you can talk to anyone yeah. who knows nothing about bourbon, but they might know. They might not even know what bourbon is, but they know that Pappy's a whiskey and that they want it. Right. Yeah. That's, it's just yeah. something that people want that they can't have. Bottom line. Well, I yeah, think that that's where I think you, you have like your your solid, you know, cornerstones of the bourbon bourbon secondary that won't change. You know, antique collections never going to change. Mictor's twenty well, years did, never going to change. Eagle um, Rare seventeen changed a lot. Well, yeah, no, no, I'm saying that's they're they're always going to have that secondary market, but I think it's the lower ones. You, you know, it's the Weller twelves, it's the Mictor's ten years, it's it's those that we'll just kind of see go away. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that just means that more available. There's not a secondary market. It's more available. So it means you can go to the store and actually find it. Not in Louisville. I, I still no, think I still, that's the thing. I, I still, still can't find it here. Well, I think we still have a, a, a long time until that goes. And, and, you know, and to Carrie's point as well, there are still smaller sects where this is happening, right? Like just smaller groups and, and just spread around a little bit more. And, you, you know, you can't be in them all. And if there's only 500 people in it and you get a good deal on something, then that's what it is. And maybe you drink it. Maybe you hold on to it and you find somebody else and you try to sell it for the same exact price. I don't know. Whatever it is, this is just it's been basically a, a collapse of the empire if you will and yeah. so now you've got all these these little armies that are trying to i wouldn't say try to take anything over but they're definitely trying to keep something alive and the one point i would agree with ryan about the part that i think hurts the average everyday person is if you wanted to trade a bottle you know it used to be easy to kind of figure out values of what you had and what you wanted and make a very similar kind of trade you know, you're staying in the hobby. You're not trying to make money from your stuff. You're just trying to trade to try different stuff. And I think from that aspect, the limited secondary market definitely makes it harder to do that, to reinvest in your hobby. Um, so I think that is that is one drawback of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I miss those trades. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's for sure. But, so yeah, there is also another thing that I kind of want to bring up, and this was a an article... Uh, that Chuck Cowdery actually had written. I, and I think uh, Jordan or Blake, whatever, kind of tipped me onto this as well, because I know I read it. Uh, however, you know, this was this was Chuck's uh, sort of summary is that saying that really the, the secondary market doesn't matter. Um, there's no objection to it or anything like that. He's just saying that basically all it's really doing is just helping out a, a, a small, limited subset of brands. Um, but if you want to just go find larceny or anything else, then it's really not a big deal. And so it really, if you wanted something that you want to find good to drink, there's plenty of stuff on the shelves. Um, but if you want to go ahead and play that game of, of what it takes to get there, then, uh, you know, to find these limited bottles, then, you know, you got to play that game. So I, you know, I'll, I'll chime in cause I think we might've thrown that out there. I appreciate, I, I appreciate sure. Chuck having his own viewpoint. Right. But what I found ironic about that article is Chuck saying that's a setup for like you're a moron. No, Chuck. no, no. Here's that's not. You, know, I, I, you know, I respect Chuck. If you don't you say it, I will. Chuck's an opinion. Yeah. Person, right. But here's here's what I found super ironic about that article. You know, he says it doesn't impact but a small few brands. Then he lists out a bunch. Right. And then he's like, but there's other good bourbon and drinks such as this, that, you know, other good weed and bourbons or stuff like this. And he lists larceny and other things. And you know what? 
I, I think that takes into account what Chuck may like, right? And what he might think is good. But there are truly people out there who have been drinking Blantons for 20 years or Weller. You know, Weller used to be my house bourbon. I would buy a case at a time, right? Just to make cocktails or throw parties and put it out, just regular Weller. And now I can't find it. And, that, and that's a shame, right? And you know what? I liked that bourbon. And I know other people out there liked Blantons. And they weren't selling it or flipping it. They just liked to drink it, right? So the people who truly like to drink the brands, yeah, the secondary market did make a big difference, right? And I'm glad that Chuck thinks, you know, there's other bourbons that might replace it. But for some folks, they don't get replaced. They've been drinking the same brand for 20 years. And it did impact them in a big way. So again, I respect Chuck having that opinion. Do I agree with it? No, not one bit whatsoever. But, you know, it's he threw it out there. So I'm going to throw it back and say, I, you know, no, that's, that's a false. That's a fallacy. Well, and the other reason he's wrong is he he points out Rittenhouse is, you know, why would Rittenhouse be $11 a few years ago and, and why has that gone up? It's because with bourbon, all all ships are rising. When you when you increase the ceiling on what people will pay for a, a, a bourbon that is popular or that people want to get, that <clears throat> gives you room to raise the price of the lower ones. And that's why we don't have... Heaven Hill six year bottled and bond anymore. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to have that anymore when a distillery can make so much money, so much more money on it, or so much more money from Rittenhouse. It's it all rises, and that's that is a direct relationship to the secondary market. I was gonna say we do still have it. We just have it uh, thirty bucks more, right? Well, that's right. It's, 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 it's there, but it's it's yeah. because it's it's you've got the secondary market that has increased demand and has increased the ceiling of what people are now willing to pay. I mean, 10 years ago, I, I could get seven different bourbons for about $25 that were fantastic that are now all over $100 on the secondary market, and you can't find, at least in Louisville, on the shelves. Yeah, yeah speaking of that marketing, Heaven Hill, bottled in bond six here, yeah. got a new yeah. label, and now you can't find it on shelves anywhere. That's right. I mean, and that's because of the secondary market. It's a direct relationship. That's where I think it, I, I think where we probably, um, we, we undersell, you know, the, the vast majority of the market a little bit with, with not bringing them into some of the decisions that we're talking about. But with this, I, I feel like there is a small percentage driving the market and prices and distilleries are looking like that. We have countless examples of them looking at the secondary and bumping prices up to that. And you're, you're trying to tell me that that doesn't drive a lot of like these rebrandings we're talking about and all this other stuff. Like th there's no way, like that's exactly what's behind it because ultimately for a lot of us, this is fun. We enjoy it. It's exciting, but these are businesses. They're trying to make the most money they possibly can. So, um, you know, I, I would have to disagree with Chuck on this one to say, n no, you're kind of missing the point that, while the 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 rudder may be a small part of the ship, it's still what's steering it. Ooh, um, good analogy. You, you can write that metaphor down. Let's send that one over. <laughs> write it down. <laughs> Put no, it in the blog, Gary. Put it in the blog, Gary. Uh, it, it's true. It um, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> No, I think that's those are all really good opinions because I and I, I tend to agree with the, the group here that I really wish that it was still around um, only because of for that sake of either seeing trends um, and everything like that. Uh, the other side of it actually going away is I feel like I have a lot more time on my hands. Uh, I feel like I can scroll through Facebook. I, I find myself getting into like high end watch groups now instead of like that's that's on my feed. And then I somehow also joined a, like a hype group. And so there's like all kinds of like shoes. That are coming on. I'm like, yeah. I'm not a sneaker. I'm not a sneaker person at all. However, and this is, I'll kind of, I'll bring this up because I find this fascinating, right? Like, we talk about flippers and everything like that and how they're the scum of the earth and blah, blah, blah. And in the shoe world, it's like, hey, that's just par for the course, man. Yep. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Like, I, I, there's a lot so, of worlds like that where it's par for the course. I hate yep. to promote another podcast on this podcast, but go listen to the, it, it's a <laughs> podcast called Business of Hype. And it's the mm -hmm. guy, Jeff Staples, who's like big into the streetwear world and, uh, and the, uh, it's produced by Hype Beast. But then you start to realize like, oh, like we're not doing anything new. This is in so many other like industries and like small niche communities and like the bourbon secondary market isn't something new. Um, but 
yeah, it's it's crazy if if you look at all that stuff, especially with sneakers. Like there's a whole other world. There's like StockX, which tracks the price of them and yeah. all this other stuff. And like we're actually a little bit behind in the bourbon world. <laughs> and w- when you look at some of these other industries, so. So Kenny, you looking at a, like vintage '40s Chuck Taylors or something? <laughs> like, going after? <laughs> no, no, just these like crazy like I like Yeezys and like mm-hmm. these. Like I don't know, like pale pink Jordans that came out. I don't really know what they are, but it it blows my mind where everybody's just like, I'll I'll pay three fifty for any pair you want in any size. I'm like, what are you gonna do with a size five and a half of pink pale Jordans, man? <laughs> like, double his money. I, I guess I guess there's a market for everything, but that's that's definitely a world that I don't know much about. But hey, it's uh, it, at least that's it's just it fascinates me that that is one world where you know flipping is just that's just par for the course like that's just the nature of the game and people are okay with it um and there's there's shoe guys that are like these guys paid a thousand dollars for a bottle of bourbon like what a (laughs) (laughs) once they opened it it was worthless dumbasses what's econ 101 it's supply and demand you know it's that you can wear shoes you can't rewear bourbon multiple times well you could resell shoes and you know i guess till you wear them (laughs) <laughs> well i think uh i think that hit on some good topics tonight so with that let's go ahead and we'll uh we'll wrap it up so fellas i want to say thank you again for coming on the show tonight because we had uh we only had three topics but we spent a good amount of time and and kind of hitting a few different things here so it was fantastic to uh to kind of kind of look about that and i i see a lot of things coming in the chat here they're talking about like i came from the sneaker game uh you know like i used to collect sneakers so it's uh it's fun to see that these are these worlds are always kind of coinciding. Maybe when one thing's hot, you you kind of go to a, gravitate to one thing. But Wait, before we wrap it up, real quick, because yeah, Carrie's go ahead. Because Carrie's not writing anymore. So Carrie, what's your what's your latest bourbon trend? What are you into? Since no one's heard from you in forever, <laughs> what are you I like drinking? Drink. I like drinking. I'm in fitness. <laughs> I'm a big fitness guru. Some guy said I look like a moose, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start here. <laughs> you know, honestly. Like, like, um, life is uh is a lot of family right now it's kids it's family it's friends it's enjoying bourbon it's i'd listen to you guys and your podcasts and check out your websites and all your stuff so honestly i'm just having fun with life right now and and when i can i'll write something and i'm on twitter and uh instagram when i can but you know just it's it's nice to just step back and uh spend a lot of time with the family and and all that good stuff and also i i didn't get to mention but you know, when I met you guys in person in September for Bourbon and Beyond, it was it was a really cool experience. Um, you guys are as cool in person, uh, most of you are. As uh, no, I'm kidding. You guys, are awesome. <laughs> um, it was it was a lot of fun getting to to meet you guys and and uh, have fun with you guys in real life. So I appreciate you bringing me back on tonight. Absolutely, Likewise, good to have you, brother. For sure, for sure. All right, well, Carrie, got you got your uh, your farewell in there, Brian or Jordan. You want to go next? Go ahead, Jordan. Sure. This is uh, so once again, wrapping up. Thanks again for having us. Jordan, one of the three guys from Breaking Bourbon. You can find us on all the socials at Breaking Bourbon. Of course, BreakingBourbon.com. Check us out for our near daily updated bottle release calendar. All right. My turn. Yeah, right, sure I'm going to give I'm going to give a shout out because this is this is part of what it's really all about. <laughs> I mean, Internet friends, right? That's that, that's why we're here. And hopefully I don't get in trouble for covering up the microphone there. Uh, but that's that's a great pick, guys. Really been enjoying it tonight. Uh, Brian from Sipping Corn. You can find me on the socials at uh, Sipping Corn, S-I-P-P apostrophe N-C-O-R-N. And, and also uh, bourbonjustice.com. Thanks, guys. Brian Very Blake fun. didn't send me a picture or a Sticker. Get the sticker. I think it's. You didn't get the sticker. Oh, oh, Email D. I'll call D. Uh, yeah, <laughs> she'll get you a sticker. All That's right, a Blake. cool bottle. You guys have my. Uh, uh, glad you guys are enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was seven. Your bottle's coming, Carrie. Okay, uh-huh. I'll get you like that. Bottle. What's the one you were gonna get me that never came? Oh, something else. Some sort you got of the uh, new riff pick. Uh, you did not send me the new riff that everybody was moaning about on the show. I'm still looking for my new riff too, Blake. You're oh yes, <laughs> okay. I love it. Everybody, Blake's on the hot <laughs> <day>. <laughs> all right, is it on me? 
Yes, sure is. <laughs> yes, yeah. Save your uh, seal box career right now. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for people who actually pay that, <laughs> not, uh, no. So I'm Blake from Bourboner. Always fun to be on here. Um, Carrie, great to have you back. Always, always a good time. And um, yeah, so check me out. All the social media is B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R.com and as well as sealbox.com if you're interested in some of these bottles that these guys are talking about it's uh we'll get them to you a lot faster than we have gotten them to to some of them so that <laughs> sealbox s e e l b a c h s so thanks for having me guys absolutely always love having uh you guys on it's always a one of the the, the best attended round tables i think we we're up to like 120 something people this time so fantastic Uh-oh. Yeah, that's like you, had, you brought in the effect. hook tonight. They call it the carry effect. Bring it in. <laughs> everybody in Cashers, North Carolina is tuning in. Oh, man, all three of us down here. Yeah. I have everybody upstairs tuned in. I turned on like eight devices and just signed You're in. Like, I'll give you s'mores if you watch in. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody, for, for joining. Make sure you follow all these guys on social media. Follow us as well, Bourbon. Uh, sorry, yeah, Bourbon Pursuit, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Go find us on TikTok because we're trying new ways of marketing. I know. Yeah. You all hate it. It's so much fun. Just get on. It'll I be won't fun. be there. Uh, I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing Renegades right now. We'll do that later. But anyway, uh, again, thank you all for, for coming in. Uh, and thank you for everybody that was sitting here joining the chat live, asking questions, being a part of it, uh, being communicative and responsive, and actually you know, having a lot of uh, good playful banter back and forth in the chat too. Always great to see that happening. And if you like the show, you want to support us, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. With that, thank you everybody, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>